Welcome to the Virtual Concert Hall's live show. Today we have a real treat as we have Irene Perry Fox and her student Dora Maywas on the show. Irene will show us how she prepares her students to perform at their best for concerts and competitions. I'm really excited about this. Let's get the show rolling. Hello everybody, welcome to the Virtual Concert Hall's live show. Today my first guest uh, is Irene Peary Fox. Her students have been frequent prize winners in international, national, state and local competitions, including the national winner of the collegiate division of the MTNA Young Artist Competition three times, and second in Yamaha High School Division. Dr. Irene Peary Fox, NCTM, Nationally Certified Teacher of Music, received a doctoral degree from the Peabody Conservatory of John Hopkins University, where she studied with Leon Fleischer. Before her doctoral work, she earned her Bachelor of Music and Master of Science degrees from the Juilliard School. While at Juilliard, she received five full-time scholarships. She has also earned an ARCT degree from the Royal Conservatory in Toronto and a Performing Arts degree in the University of Alberta, Edmonton. As a former faculty member of the Peabody Conservatory of the John Hopkins University, Dr. Fox, uh, Peary Fox taught in the preparatory department from 1980 to 1982. For the past 36 years, he has served on the piano faculty of Brigham Young University, becoming a full professor where she taught undergraduate and graduate pedagogy and graduate piano literature, as well as being the graduate piano coordinator. One of her students was the first prize winner of the International Gina Bacow competition and other finalists. More recently, Irene, Dr. Irene was the chair of the Pedagogy Saturday at the National Convention in Baltimore, where she also presented. In addition, Dr. Fox was the MTNA conference guest artist for the Washington State Music Teachers Association in June. Dr. Irene was nominated and named an MTNA National Fellow by the Music Teachers National Association. At Brian Young University, she was a recipient of the Carl G. Mesa Award for Outstanding Teaching Accomplishments and also received induction into the Golden Key International Honor Society in recognition of her outstanding contribution to Brian Young University and world and local communities in the areas of service and leadership. She has recorded Two CDs produced by Tantara Records. Currently, Irene is teaching. Uh, she is the Emeritus Faculty of Brian Young University, where she has taught for 36 years. She maintains a large private studio with many prize-winning students, one of whom is with us today. Uh, we also have her student, Dora, with us. Uh, we'll see, see her soon, and she'll be playing some excerpts for us. Uh, Dora, uh, age 16, has studied with Dr. Irene for the past six years. She has been the first prize winner of many competitions, including the Utah Symphony Salute to Youth Competition, which awarded her the opportunity to perform Rachmaninoff's Second Concerto with the Utah Symphony in Arbovano Hall. She has also performed with the American Folk Symphony, the Timpanogos, yes, Timpanogos Symphony and the Utah Philharmonic Orchestra. First prizes in solo competitions include the Utah Symphony Youth Guild for four years consecutively and the encore keyboard competition in both solo and concerto categories. Dora was the alternate winner in the 2020 MTNA State Competition, and this month was named the first prize winner in the 2021 MTNA State Competition. Congratulations, Dora. That's, that's really amazing. That's, I mean, you should be really proud of that. And so it's a real pleasure to have both of you on the show. Um, yeah, thank you for joining us. Thank you. It's really an honor to be here today and to be able to talk about one of my favorite subjects, and that's how to prepare students for performance. And that could be in a solo performance with an orchestra, for a competition, uh, whatever. But I, as, as you all know, because you're probably all teachers, the way we practice changes depending where we, we're at in the learning of a piece. When we first learn a piece, we divide it into sections and do analyze the music and very slowly work out what I call NERF, N-E-R-F, 
understanding for notes, rhythm, expression, and um, fingering. Making sure we have all the right fingerings, the notes, everything is right in place. Then as we get to the piece, to the performance level, we take on a whole new way of practicing. And that is the chart that I have um, emailed them as a PDF file, which we'll take a look at. If you could yeah. put up the first page of the chart, which just shows Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we'll take mm -hmm. a look at that. That's it right there. This is a chart that I have my students fill out, and it's just an overview of what I'm going to talk about in detail. The first one being to perform the piece. I'm very specific in the order that I like my students to practice. The reason I like them to practice the performance first is because when you go to a competition um, or to give a recital or a concert, you never know when you're going to go on stage and you don't often have a chance to warm up prior to the performance. And so it's really important to learn to just walk on to the stage and do it perfect first time. And perfect is a relative term. There's no such thing as perfect, right? <laughs> of course, yeah. <laughs> but we shoot for that, right? Because then it, mm -hmm. it'll be more perfect than if we didn't. But so to start your practicing by performing the piece, I think is an essential part of this chart. And you can start this three weeks before, before a concert or a competition, if it's an old piece or four weeks before if it's a new piece. And so you perform it and that gives you a chance to judge how you think you did and yeah. to give an evaluation. And then you keep track as you're performing how you felt you did. And the second thing you do is spot. So in other words, you go over all the spots where you don't think you were perfect enough or whether there were mistakes or yeah. memory problems and you spot those. And the, we're gonna talk about those in detail, but then the, the next thing on the chart that I have them do is practice in medium tempos. It, this chart encompasses all tempos, medium, slow, up to tempo, yeah. fast. It has three finals so that if you're playing with an orchestra, and the orchestra goes faster than you are expecting to go. You've practiced that one speed faster. If they go slower, you've practiced that one speed slower. Wow. So I you're see. safe. Yep. So you're safe yeah. no matter what. And so practicing in the medium sections, and this is what I call the musical practicing, where the students have to really study the score and make it as musical as they can. And Dora will be demonstrating that. And so that's numbers 3A and 3B. Um, and then there's the final tempos, and you'll see on that chart that there's various metronomes and various ways of practicing the final tempos, right hand, left hand, being able to play your right hand alone up to tempo, your left hand alone up to tempo. And then the final thing, number five, is a different type of slow work, which um, Dora will also demonstrate. Mm -hmm. And it takes a long time to do all of those things, especially on one piece. And yeah. so I have what I call the revised chart where I tell them numbers one, two, and five. They yeah. must do every day, even if they've got several pieces to do. So that's the performing, uh, then the spotting, and then this, one of those slow works. And th these are what we're gonna go through in detail and have Dora demonstrate. Um, but at the bottom of that page where it said some hints for sensible practicing, I think yep. it's really important to know this too, that this can take a lot of stress on the arms and on the wrists and on your body. It can make you tired, right, Dora? <laughs> and so <laughs> some things to remember is those hints for sensible practicing. Never increase the practice hours suddenly. Do it by 20 minute per day increments. Some kids, they haven't practiced for a while, so they'll sit down and say, I'm gonna practice today and they'll practice five hours. And there comes your own <laughs> problems. Yeah. <laughs> and never cram for lessons or performances. That's one thing that's tricky to get the kids not to just practice the day before. That's hard. Time. They always, uh, myself you know, included, we always try to cram things, yeah. <laughs> and that can give you arm problems. And I must say that yeah. I have a perfect record in my studio for students not having arm problems related to uh, piano practice. I mean, yes, that's it's incredible. a great their yeah. arm playing basketball or something they have an arm problem because it's not a piano but that's not your yeah. fault <laughs> exactly and i think part of that is due to the way i have them practice to the way i have them prepare their technique chart they're they're all they always have very strong technique and mm -hmm. and so they don't get arm problems but watching these 
tense at the bottom are very important. Um, starting each practice with 15 minutes of stretching. This is one one thing that Leon Fleischer really suggests. And then yeah. if you've had to go for more than one week without practicing, ease back into your normal hours. Just like we've said, don't suddenly go for four or five hours. And then take 15 minute breaks. Yeah. And so with those cautions about practicing the chart and practicing in general, let's go over the, the chart and have Dora demonstrate some things for us. I, even though I have my students do this chart in the order I've got it listed, yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to have Dora do that today because I'd like her I'd, her to demonstrate the practice things first. She okay. would be able Sounds to do good. it though. Dora <laughs> is no doubt. And in fact, you can ask her; she can tell you which parts of the chart or, or her favorites. And I like the students to get so that they can adapt to the chart and start using it to their own benefit as soon as possible. Okay. Um, so on the performance part of the chart, number one, which mm -hmm. we'll have Dora do at the end, but we'll still talk about it for a minute. I require that my students do 10 performances every time they have a performance. Even though, say, Dora played Rachmaninoff second with the Utah Symph Symphony this way, this week. Yeah. And so she gave 10 performances. And next month she has to play it again with the Utah Philharmonic Orchestra. Um, I still require to give another 10 performances. Wow, so, I see. Mm -hmm. So each time performing the piece is really important. And that could be for people other than your immediate family. Yep. Sometimes you're not feeling nervous if it's just for mom or dad. Or it could be for anybody that makes you nervous. Or a really good thing is to video yourself. And I require them to do video themselves two times before an actual performance. Mm -hmm. And listen back and... Um, critique themselves and see how they look and sound. Yeah. And another one is, this is number four up there, and this will sound strange to you, Chris, have you ever done this? Performing with the stereo on so loud that you can't hear yourself. <laughs> and that's a great test for visual memory. It I is. Can, I can remember doing that a lot, putting the stereo oh. on some pop music so loud that yeah. I couldn't hear myself playing and play yeah. through my piece, and I could only see if my fingers were doing the right things. And, that and, and was, you have to trust your physical memory as well to, to, to know how to move in order to get, get to those keys. Exactly. It's a great mm -hmm. test for your memory and your physical motions. Mm -hmm. and, and on every performance, I ask them to do the bows and imagine themselves in the hall they'll be playing in. In fact, when I was studying with Leon Fleischer, this is one thing he really stressed. He said, imagine yourself in your dress you're going to wear, go out on the stage, take your bow, play your whole performance through beginning to end without a mistake <laughs> mm -hmm. and then take your bows at the ends of your pieces and be finished and then evaluate how you did. And then, then, you, then the next thing is the spots. Um, so performing is a vital part of performing. That was a quote from another teacher that I had um, at Peabody who taught ensemble, Seth. Do you, do you remember his name? I don't, I don't remember his last name, but performing is a vital part of performing. And I have that written up in a little plaque in my studio mm -hmm. uh, to help my students remember that they have to perform because that's what the, you don't just play things through. You actually perform yeah. them. Yeah, absolutely. And now we're on to spots. And this is where I've, I'm, I'm going to ask Dora to help. Um, after you perform a piece, Hopefully you've ke you've kept really good track of where you need extra help, and you can decide from a number of items on this chart what you want to do for spotting. The first one is rhythms, and you can see them written there. And I put the metronome speeds I have my students do them at. There's nine rhythms, and I'll have or demonstrate them. So each one of those in the double bar lines is a separate rhythm. You have to choose a spot that has all the same kinds of notes, all eighth notes or all 16th notes or all 32nd notes. Then right. you do a different rhythm every day. I used to, when I was trying to get something perfect, I used to try one each day and then I could sense which one was really helping me the most. And then mm -hmm. that's what I stressed. Or you can do with accents and you can see on number two on the accents first there's an accent on the first group of first note of the four sixteenths then the second note, and then the third note, and then the fourth note. And then yep. Um, yep. 
I'll just go through all these and then Dora will demonstrate. I'll ask her to choose a spot. She's good at spotting. In fact, <laughs> in fact, Dora, tell the listeners what are your favorite parts of this chart? I think overall my favorite part would be the situation section perfect. Because okay. I feel like in that spot you can kind of take the other elements of this part. Yeah. Right. So that's where you look at like a page or a section of the piece and you look at your music and you try to get it so that you can play it three times in a row perfect. And I find that that's really helpful because I can, in that same moment, work on my high lab and then you can just write it a little bit and you can write it a little bit and you can write it. I just love how it's like three times in a row perfect. So she's talking about page three, page two. The medium tempo is where you choose any five speeds be below your three final speeds and you study the score first with the music in front of you this is the musical practice it's straight musical and you look at that and you notice every single marking put up um, there by the composer and by the teacher yep. and yeah. play it through once and then you close your there music we go. that it is yeah mm -hmm. three times in a row perfect and what's so stressful about that i've had a lot of kids tell me that that's their what they feel is the most effective part of their practice <laughs> is because yeah. when you get to the third time if, if let's say you've done the first two times perfect when you get to the third time and you make a mistake you have to go back and start at number one again right and also on the third time it makes you feel like you feel when you're actually giving a performance like i've got to do this perfect this time yeah so there's that added important. pressure for, by from yourself to get it right. right and it's scary but if you can get it then you have more confidence when you actually perform that it's worked you know you, you actually have it in your fingers which i think is great yeah it's very good so that's a, a really effective way to practice on number three a yeah um so dora dora's going to perform at the end of this class you can tell me chris when she should how long is this delay so she's got a four minute list A2 to transcend attitude number five. Love it, love it. That and sounds great. So she'll do some practicing on that for you. And then okay. we'll, you tell me when it's time for her to play it through. Um, so, Dora, how do you spot Poufle? Choose a spot and tell us what you're doing. Okay. Um, so I'm going to work on the rhythm. And this mm -hmm. is a passage that has. And then you can make it harder by doing put on the metronome you're doing she's doing she's doing the third rhythm of the first line is that 200 Come on 200 okay. that 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 make it nice and strong How do you feel that helps, Dora? Um, I think mean, it's actually, so this passage has a lot of like, intervals, yeah. double intervals that you have to play. And I find that uh, by changing the, the amount of speed you have used between these intervals, this the rhythm, I, I don't know, I find that. Okay, very good. Did you try any of the other rhythms with it? Yeah. yeah it yes, please. Which rhythm are you going to play now? And then hope the, then I hope the listeners get the idea. Okay, now she's doing the second one. Okay, now demonstrate how one of the accents. You can turn off the metronome. <laughs> But it's important to follow those speeds that I've set there because it they give you just enough complications in yep. doing it that it helps you get the passage. 
if it's too well, what easy. What I also like about it is that on those on those when, when you're not playing loud, you have a bit of time. Oh, no, sorry, when you're not playing fast, you have time to think about the next group that is gonna be faster, and you have a bit of time. You're not always playing everything fast. You're playing some slower, some faster, and during the slower, you have a bit of time to imagine or visualize what you have to do next which is faster um right and that's really good for the brain too and for memory yeah so it absolutely. Has lots of different advantages practicing like that just playing your piece through mm -hmm. all the time is not a good way to practice no you're gonna give you your brain more variations so that when things go wrong or things happen you're okay you know, or they don't happen nothing happens and nothing phases you exactly perfect nothing phases you now show a little bit of the accents. Which one are you doing? Well, let's see if we can guess. Be strong about it. Okay. So what advantage does that have, Chris? Well, you're, you, you're doing accents on things you might not usually think of as a downbeat or as an as a place where there is an accent and so by doing it this way you're training your brain to eventually um kind of accent all the all the all the notes and you know clearly where where the technique should be exactly. is that would that would that be the right answer yes that's a good answer what would you say Dora? in this section um when you split up the tempo i have a tendency to actually skip that note because it comes Sometimes I don't even play it, and I think by doing like the accent thing, you kind of like overdo it, and you overcome yeah. it. Yeah. And in the real life performance, you kind of turn your fingers to now hit that note. Mm -hmm. So it makes you yeah. very aware of every note, not just the accent, the real accented note. And, and when you accent, you actually have to put a bit more force into it. So you physically, you also have to prepare for that accent, and so that allows you to not kind of slip it um which can happen when you just run through it all and you don't really have the intention to play that accent or play that note with intention exactly mm. so it helps Great you to play tip. every single yeah. note with intention and then the groupings did you, did you do any of the groupings in in your etude Show us the groupings and see if you can guess which grouping. I so, thought she was asking me. <laughs> I was like, well, <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> no, of course, Dora, go ahead. Your groupings. Do you play for filet, Chris? No, I don't, no, I don't play for filet. Uh, not yet. Good. It's been too scary. <laughs> but not, not for Dora. <laughs> it's a very beautiful attitude. So you can see on the groupings that I've got where you, if you've got a whole set of 16th notes, you can go to the third one, yada da dum, da da dum, da da dum, da da dum. Or else you can go to the fourth one, yada da dum, da 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 dum, da 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 dum, or to the fifth one. And again, that those little groupings really help for accuracy and to help you feel what's happening in tiny groups. So Dora, go ahead and do show us what you've done in groupings. she was doing in the groups of six which is very wow. helpful yeah i think what groupings is that uh what's really helpful is it, it especially if you do smaller groupings it's that you, your brain is able to comprehend those little groupings and then when you put them in a bigger scheme you're not thinking about like you know 48 notes you're thinking about you know three 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 or in six 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 and so it becomes a lot more dissectable in your brain and it's not as overwhelming as having to play like a pa like a form measure oh. passage that's too scary exactly so breaking big long passages into little groupings in your practicing makes it more sustainable makes it more that you're, you're more capable of your brain processing mm -hmm. the great big long passage into shorter passages Absolutely. And then the different articulations. Um, Dora, do you ever play any staccato passages legato and vice versa? This is on page two now. Okay, good. And so I think you're all clear what that would be. I'd, I will run out of time if we take this much time on each little one. And then <laughs> on four, Although I'd love to get all the details of it. This is really great. Yeah, um, well, mm -hmm. I, 
I think that on the different articulations, just a long passage, it's all staccato, play it legato instead. And if it's legato, play it staccato. Yep. Especially the last one works if it's legato, play it staccato, because it helps get the articulation, even though it has to be very legato. And then on the chords, I can remember my um, early teacher, Dr. Gladys Egbert from Calgary, Alberta, was mm -hmm. really a proponent of approaching the chords from high above the keys in the Rachmaninoff Second Concerto, where it goes da 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 She had had me practice from high above the keys, down, bam, 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 bam. And, and she'd say, you know, if you can get those accurate, by coming way high above the keys and into the right chords. And Dora, you did that too, didn't you? When you were doing Rachmaninoff second. Then it'll be really easy to just do it right from the key. Da, 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 da. And it really worked. And so that's a chord technique, practicing difficult chords. And then repetitions, and I said, play it 50 times a day. And that, of course, is an exaggeration. I'm just saying, practice oh. when people say, <laughs> You were thinking I really made him keep track of the 50 Well, times. I don't know. There's, there's a very detailed approach to this. If you say 50, you know, as a student, I would probably obey. Well, maybe not, but well, I would I'll assume that's what you meant. That's because you're Chris. But actually, I had another student that I told him to do that. And I said, no, I don't mean 50. And, but I mean, practice, 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 practice. Somebody asked, how do you get something perfect? Yeah, the answer was practice, 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 practice. Is there any other way? And so this 50 times, I, I, there was a passage that he could play the whole concerto perfect, but just not this one little area. And so I said, you know, practice that a lot. It doesn't need to be 50 times, but practice it a lot. He came to his next lesson with a rubber ball and that he had made with rubber bands. And each one of those rubber bands, and the ball was big, and each one of those rubber bands represented one of the times that he had practiced that passage. And boy, could he play it perfectly. It was absolutely perfect. So there we've got two sections of the chart and there's three to go. Now I'm gonna have Dora demonstrate the medium tempos. And these okay. are practicing for straight musicality. And where you study the score, you do it, we've already talked about this, and you do it three times in a row, perfect. And you concentrate mostly on listening and playing musically the sound you want, the dynamics you want. Because mm -hmm. if, a, if a piece doesn't have the right dynamics, it's not perfect. If, it's not, if it doesn't have the right sound, it's not perfect. It has to have all of those compo components. So yeah. Dora, choose a section of your piece. And you, you said you, this is one of your favorites. And show us how you practice. First of all, does the audience understand what the um, medium speeds are. Let, let's say you're fine. I would assume so. So obviously not at tempo and not very slowly, but at a medium that's comfortable, but also where you can really be articulate and clear with what you're trying to trying to say, especially when a piece is um, on the newer side. Or, or, or is yeah. there some other definition for medium that you, you would have? No, just to be specific with the kids, I say it's any five speeds below the three finals. So let's say your final is 100, then your three mm. finals would be 100, one above, 104, and one below 96. And yeah. then your medium speeds would be any five below 96. A lot of times, young students, when you're teaching them, they have to know exactly what medium tempo is. Yeah, they need and, specifically in the metronome <laughs> what that tempo really is. Yep, absolutely. And, and you can tell them what, what they are, and then they can set the metronome to get the speed, but then not yeah. play with it but just so that they oh. are doing a good medium <laughs> yeah. speed. Because, I mean, music has to flow. You can't always have it exactly mm -hmm. with a metronome. So, Dora, mm -hmm. tell us what you're doing. So she's checking for her medium tempo. <laughs> <laughs> the heads bop into it. She knows it's, it's, a, it's a comfortable, more comfortable one.
huh? Yeah, well, I didn't hear every single note. So you'd probably want to go back and spot that a little bit and try again to, I mean, you didn't have any note mistakes, but it wasn't technically. I, I, I want to appreciate the fact that this is, you know, live. It's, um, it's almost like a performance and performing like this is incredible pressure. So if you can do this somewhat good, Dora, then you'll be fine for your performance. <laughs> this is just a crazy, <laughs> crazy ex experiment uh, your teachers <laughs> and we're doing on you. Uh, and I just want to say, yeah, you're doing so great. It's, it's not easy at all to practice in front of people and be aware that people are watching you practice. It's, it's not easy. So, yeah. Well, and the other thing is, have you ever found, Chris, that playing a piece slightly under tempo is technically more difficult? Oh, yeah. Like, like what she was doing is several speeds slower than it goes. And yeah. sometimes when you try to do that, it's, it's harder technically than it is to just do it right up to tempo. So that's why the medium speeds are so important to do. Yeah, your brain more, almost has more time to kind of almost uh, overthink and you kind of, you, it's, it, it, there's a tendency to feel like, oh, hey, I, is this easier? Oh, wait, is it easier? Or oh, what if I did this and what if I did that? Oh, oh no, and then, you, and then you screw it up. Whereas if you play it at full tempo, there's some kind of automation about it that perhaps just kind of pushes you on and you're not quite overthinking it as much. I think it's all to do with your brain anyways. <laughs> right, and I think that's one of the most important things about doing the medium tempo is it really helps you focus on, I really don't play this quite evenly and I don't quite have this. And, it, and so you focus on it a little bit stronger than if you're just always playing it up to tempo. It's really important mm -hmm. to do that. I totally agree, totally agree. And then the, um, the next one is the hands alone on medium work. So just going through your whole piece um, in a medium tempo, mm -hmm. hands alone with no pedal and trying to do it by memory. So Dora, do you think that you would be able to play your right hand alone all the way through? I'm not going to ask you to do this right now. You, you don't have to. You say yes or no. <laughs> <laughs> good, good reply, Chris. And so, yeah, so do you think you could play it through? I'm just asking you, Dora, but I'm not going to ask you to do it. From beginning to end, right hand alone at a medium tempo with no pedal. Yeah, I think it's Yeah, because it's hard. Mm. So being able to do right hand alone or left hand alone. I know by the time you've done this chart and if you've done it well, you can play each hand alone. In fact, I one of my college winners was here accompanying their daughter the other day for a competition she's doing. And I I was saying, Amanda, tell, tell the class how you used to play so perfectly for all these competitions because she won first in the collegiate division of the national MTNA. And she said, I followed the chart, every single part of it. Wow. And that's how I did it. Yeah. And so, I mean, doing all of these separate things, hands alone, hands together, all the different tempos, the rhythms, the different ways of spotting, that's how you get a piece perfect. Yeah. And then final tempos. Mm -hmm. This is at Let's the bottom of that. page two and we're all almost finished. Um, Playing it through with no pedal, either hands alone or hands together with all the interpretation. Can you see that on your chart? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then these, these are the tempos that you're currently perfect at and one speed above that and one speed below, below that, like I've mentioned before, just in case nerves get you going one speed faster or an orchestra goes one speed slower, just any yeah. of those kinds of scenarios. And do these without the music, remembering everything worked on in the medium tempos. And I have to tell you, when my daughter, Christy Peary, um, studied with Leon Fleischer also, and she got the opportunity, won the opportunity to play Rachmaninoff third piano concerto with the Samara Russia Symphony wow. in their big Russian festival. And so she was studying with Leon Fleischer. So she went in for her lesson and guess what he asked her to do? He said, okay, Christy, what I'd like you to do is play the Rachmaninoff third all the way through, beginning to end, at a slow tempo, without pedal, looking up with your eyes closed. Now, how do you? Why do you think he asked that? And what do you think the complicate the problems could be with that? The difficulties. 
so was it to end the piece with with, with your with the eyes up or was it to start it it was to play the whole piece through oh, play. <laughs> beginning to end with her wow. head up her eyes closed and just the way yeah. it goes with all the dynamics and everything mm. but just at a slow tempo and she called me to tell me guess what he asked me to do and i said well how did you do well, because of this chart, because she had studied with me, I'd been her own teacher, she could do it because she had practiced doing it. She said, but I'd never ask her to do it looking up with her eyes closed. And I said, well, how did you do it without looking at the keys? And she says, I just peeked under my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> I guess what it does, especially after you've done this method and, you know, applying that um, kind of thought experiment or the, the kind of way to uh, perform it with Fleischer is that, nothing will like i said nothing will phase you and you you're able to try different variations of performing in order to 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 test you so that, and what's going to happen is when you get to the real performance it's easy and that's what you yeah. want you want the performance exactly. to be easy and fun and comfortable but all the work before it has to be uncomfortable in order for the real performance to be comfortable exactly so, Dora, I don't know if you've emphasized that part of the chart, playing it up to tempo with no pedal. Well, just the way it goes, but with every dynamic and not looking at the keys. Have you ever done that, Dora? Um, I haven't really looked at the keys, but I play it with the muscles, especially in very technical sessions. Right. Especially like when I ask them, sometimes I'll sometimes play more Good. And when you're doing these, it's important to look at number D on the at the very end of page two, which is when you're doing these three tempos, the final, the one above it, and the one below, keep going no matter what. Imagine yourself performing in the actual place, like mm -hmm. Fleischer said, and for the one time you're using the metronome, you may stop only to change the metronome if it's a different metronome. Yeah. So I have suggested one time of practicing with the metronome, which I think is very good. Yeah. And then one of the three times must be perfect. So there's three times of those final tempos. And have you, have you ever tried playing this with a, with a recording? And I know, Dora, you've done this. And I find this to be very inspiring. This is at the top of page three now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Number F. Yeah, yeah. I can remember when I was playing the Campanella, I was actually studying with Fleischer. And... Um, I just thought, I wonder how I do compared to one of these perform one of these recordings. And I th think I put on Andre Watts and tried to play along. And I thought, oh my gosh, you are too slow. You could add the pedal here. You could, I mean, I he he was so inspiring that I mean I didn't listen to him to do anything that he was doing, but just to play along to see if I was keeping up the momentum. And it can really be inspiring. And I have my students do that when they're going to play at the orchestra. Dora, you did that. Yeah. So that they um, learn the orchestra part really, really well, just so it's natural for them to just come in. But it's yeah. very inspiring uh, too. Uh, what I like about this is also you start to visualize yourself either in the concert hall or with the orchestra and being on stage and being surrounded by you know the orchestra. And that part of visualization and part of being there, uh, not I, I think it's not only really helpful for a performance, but it's also very, like you said, very inspiring because then you feel it's an extraordinary experience apart from just you know isolating yourself in a practice room and working on the notes exactly it's so inspiring to just do that once in a while to just make sure you're right up there with a, the best of the best mm -hmm. and then the last one is slow work and after mm -hmm. we demonstrate this slow work i'll have dora play her piece and then you can comment or ask her any questions sure now yeah. i have them uh, this is just one part of this chart that includes so many different things but I have them practice each technical part with high, what I call high loud fingers, which I learned from my first teacher in Canada. And she really uh, was a proponent of this high loud fingers. And then also my teachers at Juilliard, uh, Freundick and Kabash. And, and then um, at Peabody, Jan Fleischer was mostly for close fingers. And mm -hmm. So why don't, why don't we learn to play with our fingers high, medium, close? All of those give different colors. 
and the high loud fingers really give you strength and articulation and yeah. they're wonderful for accuracy do you do you do high loud fingers chris yeah i i i like to do those high loud especially when i'm learning the piece or practicing you know when it's not fully learned yet uh it just helps for me personally to physically feel like i'm attack uh, i'm kind of approaching the key um in a high level way as opposed to just sort of uh, being too close to it so when i'm when i'm learning it i, I like to do that in order to kind of almost like ingrain <laughs> like i think of it like a typewriter like typing those individual notes into the head so that it, it feels uh, but also without exactly. using that the tension because i think tension is the one like if you're thinking high loud some people may think oh i've got to play everything you know with this high intensity but no i think without using tension to play that loudly and with the high fingers is really helpful and it also makes you so you can play softer it's unbelievable it's magical because your fingers are so uh into the keys and so yeah. used to knowing exactly what keys they're playing you can just play them very light on the keys dora demonstrate mm -hmm. a passage with high loud fingers and then we've already talked about 5b which is slow performing which mm -hmm. i told you about christy in russia and so after you've done a passage in slow work, yeah. why don't you perform the piece for us? Now, hopefully, you'll, as she performs this, you'll be able to hear some of the parts she's been working on. I can't wait. <laughs> Thank you. 
Wow, that's fantastic. Could you hear the piano okay? Yeah, absolutely. That sounded okay. really good. It was sparkling and there was no clip. It was, it was really great. Dora, I'm going to ask if you could, um, if there's a chair or a seat next to you, or if you can pull up this um, piano chair, because sometimes it's hard for us to hear you from, um, all yeah. the way from over there. So if you could get a little closer to the microphone. Bench. Yeah, if you could just move the bench. Perfect. Thank you for that. Didn't want to make you move when you were um, demonstrating, but now that you're done playing, <laughs> Congratulations, that's not easy to have to perform live, demonstrate all the little little pieces. Um, <laughs> congratulations, thank you so much. Is so there anything you want to have any questions for Dora? Uh, currently, we don't have any comments or questions. I do have one though. Um, uh, for both of you, I guess, what happens when you feel like you've kind of you're trying to get through the list, but you're kind of stuck? Um, on doing one or two of them. Like, let's say, you know, those three times perfectly and you just can't get to the third one. You've already been practicing for about an hour and a half and getting through it and you haven't gotten to the end part yet. What, what do you do? Do you just leave it for the next day? Where do you start off, you know, on the next day? What, what's your answer, Dora? And then I'll give my answer. All right. <laughs> um, I think what you do is you really try to rotate through as many of them as you can and do them each day. But you also want to consider that you hit... Um, I guess what you would call like the base or like the foundational ones. So stuff like the, like she mentioned at the beginning, like one, two, and I think it was like five, like those you really want to hit every day. Yeah. Um, so if it's something other than that, then I think it's a good idea just to take a press, you know, get some rest and come back to it another day and really work with it. Good. She answered that correctly. <laughs> I mean, if you, get, if you get stuck like that, then go on, yeah. do something else. And mm. I, I it was a great, I, I can't remember which great concert pianist that actually said that, that if you get stuck on a passage and you just can't get it perfect, just go on and next day you'll do it fine. Yeah, so it's you, true, it's true. You know, so if you've, if you've done what you need to on your pricing, done your slow work, done your medium and everything is, you've done everything you can do, then just go ahead and go on to the next passage and the next day it'll be that fine. Mm. I, I do have one uh, other question, and it, but probably for the both of you. Uh, you mentioned in this text in the PDF that there is something, you know, visualizing, and you know, and that could be part of your mental practice. So that all the work doesn't have to be on and at the instrument. That you could probably sit, you know, somewhere relaxing, and then just visualize yourself playing it. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about that, and whether you know, Dora, oh. if you've done that before, and if that's effective for you? This is on page four, so go to page four of the PDF. Mm -hmm. And this is mental rehearsal. And this is something that I just naturally did as a pianist. I just was really so concerned about doing my pieces correctly that I'd go to bed at night before a mm -hmm. performance and I'd take my music and put it by on my bedside table <laughs> and I'd turn off my light and I'd start playing my pieces through beginning to end imagining and knowing every note that I was playing in the right hand and the left hand. And if I couldn't remember one of the notes, I'd turn on the light and look at the music and get it. <laughs> and then yep. repeat that passage and go on until I'd gone through my whole performance. Wow. And so, I mean, and I found that knowing that this mentally just may, may, meant that when I was on the stage, I just knew what I was doing. And yeah. so that's under mental rehearsal. I'll, do you do that, Dora? Yeah, I do that sometimes as well. Or when I'm uh, listening to a recording or so, then I'm also kind of imagining the piece and so I'm hearing it. Yeah. And stuff like that. And that's especially helpful in sessions with a lot of vibrato as well that I'm trying to mimic. Like and so there's no fingers involved there. Mm -hmm. It's all mental. And then on page four, where it says memory check that the first thing, can you play through every note mentally with no fingers? Mm -hmm. Can you play it on a tabletop with no sound? Can you play it with noise blocking the sound of the piano? That's what I was telling you earlier today. Yep. Can you play it with your eyes closed looking up, which is what Fleischer had, my daughter? <laughs> Can you play it slowly by memory? That's yeah. on the chart too. Can you play it hands alone by memory? That's on the chart too. And can you play it without pedal by memory? So what happens if you've only done, if you can only play like do it through the, the first four, but you haven't, it's the night before the performance and you haven't done the last three. Uh, <laughs> do, do you just tell your students, you know what, look, you sound good, you're prepared, 
just have fun with it or is the, is the advice more like oh maybe you should have prepared better uh, but we'll do that next time I, I would probably tell them they're sounding great and just go for it and then after the performance I'd tell them prepare better yeah. <laughs> I don't want to be negative with them before right now Dora's got the divisions of the MTNA coming up she's mm. got Beethoven Opus 111 and she's okay. got Bach, Pearl and Fugue, F major, book two, isn't that right? And then she's got Fufale, and then she's got Rachmaninoff second sonata. And that's of all, fantastic. And, and so, I mean, repertoire. that's a huge program. And the Fufale that she just played is probably the hardest. That's why I had her do it today. Yeah. The hardest, Cause it's hard. Technically it's got all those intervals of thirds yeah. and fourths that are going at breakneck speed and they have to be yeah. light and accurate. And so it's, it's a good performance opportunities, as many as you can get. And then uh, the last sheet I put on there is just fun to, to give students what good practicing sound like and what <laughs> bad practicing yeah. sound like. Just to give a pair of little kids. I don't think Dora would need this, but, but for those of you who have younger students, this is good for them to look at that. And the, the, those in the audience, I don't know if we need to stand, stop, I mean, or if we could go through that. but. The, the, we can the, go through it. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Yeah. And so this talks about what good practicing sounds like and what bad practicing sounds like. And so good practicing is with metronome at tempos that are not too fast, and bad practicing is no metronome and too fast. Yeah. And so I think you find that a lot of times you need to practice with the metronome, even though it can't be your playing can't be metronomic, but you have to play the metronome to make sure that you're not going too fast. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And learning in two to four major phrases, practicing in small sections. I, in the medium tempos, I have them mark the sections in the music. So mm -hmm. that on each page, there's a different section or a couple of sections. So yeah. they can start several places in each page. Yeah, it's really, really important. Time. It's really important. And really important. And instead of just always playing the piece through, you have those sections. Practicing hands alone instead of always together. Playing something and fixing mistakes is good practicing. And bad practicing is making mistakes and going on without fixing the, the mistakes in your, yeah. your practice, not in your performance. And mistakes are drilled until they are learned, which is really bad. Uh, and so mis mistakes are drilled until they're fixed is good practicing. And then many repetitions is good practicing poor Poor practicing is just playing it once or twice and not doing the repetitions. Yeah. And then um, the next one is eighth and sixteenth note passages are practiced with high loud fingers, which she just demonstrated. And then bad practicing is no practicing on eighth and sixth note passages. <laughs> <laughs> How could that be? And then forte and staccato practicing is good practicing and just everything the same dynamic is poor practicing. And musically perfect is good practicing and not paying attention to dynamics and precision and voicing and with no rubato is poor practicing. Wow. So lots of different ideas on what you should be doing in your practicing, what you should be concentrating on. Yeah, definitely. And it's a, it takes a long time, but it's worth it. And if you've got a whole lot of pieces to play like Dora has or a whole concert, you do a revised chart. Mm which I was saying, you, you pick and choose. You always do number one, two, and five A. Always yeah. do that, but then pick amongst the other ones, maybe one a day to do. So you do your performing, your spotting, and your slow work. And then you pick one of your mediums and one of your different final slow performing, one of those, and one of those to do every day. Because yeah. you don't have time to do it all. No, you don't. But I, what I like is that this is a a recipe, a preparation uh, in order to be able to play your best. I think one of the things that, you know, give people a lot of anxiety when performing is not knowing whether they're going to play well or not and feeling like, you know, the whole world is against them, everything's going to go wrong. And I think this preparation method gives a lot of students a, a, a security and a reassurance that, no, I want to go on stage. I've already done all the scary things, you know, I, yeah. uh, someone could drop a drop a ton of bricks in the hall. I'm fine. I've done the whole stereo <laughs> on um, thing. 
you know, the, the piano can start moving. That's fine. I've got my eyes closed. I know, I know where the notes are. You know, there are all these things that can scare people from performing. Um, if they follow this method, I feel like a lot of that can be mitigated and a lot of fears can be d diminished. That is so true. And, and on this chart, variety is really good. So, I mean, once you've done this number one, two, and 5A, and you say, I'm going to try now doing this slow performing. Mm -hmm. And only do one other thing, try slow performing today. And then the next day, try finals with no pedal. And the next day, try section seats hand alone by memory. So one of the other things that we've talked about today. So mm -hmm. when you've got a lot of pieces to play, you can just choose one of those others to do for a check to reduce your stress and do just what you said, Chris, make it possible so that a bomb could fall on you. Actually, I played during an earthquake once. I was playing the Wallstein piano sonata. Yeah. And I was doing the And the piano started moving forward and I thought, my goodness, I'm really getting into this. This is the piano's moving away from me. And then yeah. pretty soon out of my the right side of my uh, face, I saw my eyes. I saw the audience start to leave and I thought, am I doing something wrong? The piano's moving, people are leaving. And then yeah. I saw the chandelier. Well, nightmare. <laughs> I saw it, but I didn't miss a note. And the chandelier started to swing and I thought, oh, something's going on. Yeah. And pretty soon I heard somebody announce that there's an earthquake and everybody needs to evacuate the building immediately. So it does, what you were saying, it, it's really true. It helps you so you can play through an earthquake and it's just fine. Yeah, you must have been disappointed. You, you, <laughs> I can imagine you thinking internally, I can keep going. <laughs> I can keep doing this. What's wrong? <laughs> exactly. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, this has been such a great pleasure. Um, I, I really enjoyed this. It's been extremely helpful for me, and I know for our audience, it's going to be incredibly important. Uh, what we're going to do with a lot of our um, broadcasts is we will repurpose the content. So we'll do a little clip. So we might do, you know, section one, section two, and so we'll send them to you, and we'll have the audience uh, be able to. So they don't have to watch the whole lecture. I mean, they can if they want, but they can watch it in little clips, and it's helpful for everybody to 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 do so. Uh, so we we'll definitely we we'll definitely do that. And so I want to thank you, Dora, for playing under such immense pressure. You're going to sound great. All the best for mm -hmm. your upcoming performances, and you have such a great program and everything sounds really great at least from my end <laughs> i know dr irene might have a few things to say to you but i think you sound fantastic um, and once again thank you dr irene this has been a great pleasure well thank you chris you're a lot of fun to work with and it's been really fun having you as my host no <laughs> it's been really thank really fun so yeah, thank you. And uh, I recognize this stage. This is uh, where Daniel Hughes played last year. And, yeah, and this he is also, your Yeah, he also performed in the Sound as Perceiver competition, was a prize winner and played beautifully, was such an incredible um, fellow competitor. We weren't competing in the same categories, but it was very lovely to hear him perform before me. Uh, and speaking of our competition, uh, just a few brief words to our audience. Uh, we're still accepting uh, applications until the end of November. And so... Uh, get your applications in. We have no repertoire requirements uh, at all, so you can play and program anything you want. Uh, there's no time limits for semi-finalists and finalists, so this is a great chance to play all the repertoire you want, get things out there. Maybe you're preparing for something even bigger later on. Well, we'd love to hear it. We'd love to, you know, um, be a part of that process. The third thing is that uh, right after you play, you get immediate feedback from the judges. A lot of time in competition, you have to wait to find out how you did or you're not sure what the judges think. You'll know right away. And I think this is one of the great advantages of playing on the virtual stage is that the audiences and the judges are there listening to you. Um, we have over $100,000 worth of value of prizes from collaborations to performances in places like Carnegie Hall. Um, performance opportunities like that, as well as scholarships and masterclasses. And everything like today is live broadcasted. As Dora will attest, you know, this was not pre-recorded and she couldn't do it like three or four times before we finally, you know, got the take that she wanted. This was live. And so every round of a competition is just like that, which gives an immediacy and a freshness to it. And best of all, the audience gets the best seat in the house. Everybody gets to see the piano front on. There's no heads or anything blocking you. <laughs> so it's a, it's a fantastic opportunity to perform and 
and to meet other musicians. So I hope you consider applying at our website below. And with that, thank you everybody for attending. Thank you again, Dr. Irene. Thank you, Dora. This has been such a pleasure. I uh, look forward to hearing you and all the best for your competition, Dora. Mm. All right. Uh, once again, I want to thank uh, also our San Jose board, as well as our producer, uh, Ante Bortrix Kudrix, who's been incredible today, going through different uh, camera views, as well as through the PDF and everything. So really appreciate all your hard work behind the scenes. And yeah, until next time, uh, take care and we'll see you soon. Bye. No matter where you are or who you are, music connects us all. We started with a dream, but now we are paving the future. Welcome to the Sound Espressiva Global Competition. Fully virtual, yet bringing musicians closer together than ever before, now on a global scale. True live, inclusivity, diversity, connection, community, an extraordinary array of judges. Get noticed by companies all over the world. Prizes scholarships, performance opportunities. Apply to be a part of the most exciting congregation of artists like nothing you've ever seen before. We guarantee quality and leave no musician behind. We can't wait to hear you on the virtual stage.